top ten. Got my motivation high for my top ten. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Dr. Andrew Huberman, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Use the breathing technique. One of the reasons why breathing is such a powerful tool for shifting one's state is that a, it's always available for voluntary control. It's just right there. You can, I can decide right now to do three inhales or I can just go back to breathing reflexively. I can just do that in any moment. So the, the neural you know, real estate, which is in the brainstem that controls breathing, is in a unique position because it's at the kind of boundary between conscious control and unconscious control. I can't do that for my digestion. I can't do that for... Most, most everything that happens internally. The other thing is that breathing controls our level of alertness very dramatically. So the faster you breathe, generally, the more alert you are. The slower you breathe, the more calm you're gonna be. The faster you breathe, meaning shorter quick breaths or? <laughs> Either way. So, um, so if we're just to take a brief um, adventure through the, the neuroscience of breathing and how it relates to brain states. And, and there's some fun tools in here. So forgive me for this tangent, but you have two brain areas that are responsible for breathing. One is called, for the aficionados, the pre Butzinger complex. It was discovered by Jack Feldman at UCLA. It's named after a bottle of wine. So now you want, people won't forget it. And it controls rhythmic breathing. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. It's just rhythmic breathing. There's another brain area that controls breathing which is near what's called the parafacial nucleus, which involves breathing anytime there are double inhales or double exhales or triple inhales. And you say, well, why would you have this second brain area for breathing? Well, it turns out when you're speaking or crying or coughing, you need to coordinate your breathing with your speaking. And that means sometimes you need to take multiple inhales or multiple exhales, and this is all happening very, very fast. You don't notice. But there's a very important discovery that was made a few years ago by Jack's lab and by a guy named Mark Krasno at Stanford who discovered there's a set of neurons in your brainstem, my brainstem, everybody's brainstem, and every animal, every mammal's brainstem. It's a very small number of neurons that controls a specific pattern of breathing, which are called physiological size. So these are not just size where you go and exhale. These are size that involve doing two inhales and then an extended exhale. We all do this. You do this during sleep. Anytime carbon dioxide levels in your bloodstream get too high, in order to get more oxygen into your system. People also do this if they've been crying or sobbing, they'll do this and then they'll exhale. So what's happening with these physiological sides and why is this powerful? So your lungs are two big bags of air, but they actually are made up of a ton of little sacks of air called the alveoli of the lungs. When we are exercising or when we are sleeping or anytime we're doing anything, these, these little sacks of air eventually start to collapse and what happens is carbon dioxide builds up in our system and we experience that as stress. We actually feel the impulse to breathe because carbon dioxide levels get too high. There are neurons that sense carbon dioxide. And then without realizing it, you do a double inhale and then exhale. Typically the inhales are done through the nose and the exhale is done through the mouth. So it looks like and why the second inhale? Well, if you've ever um, tried to blow up a balloon for a kid at a kid's party or just blown up a balloon, you sometimes blow into that empty balloon, it doesn't, it doesn't work go anywhere. So time. what do you do? You do two in, you do two, you go and then it pops open. So these double inhales pop open the alveoli of the lungs. Huh. They don't explode them, but they pop them open, which pulls carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream, brings oxygen, and then you offload carbon dioxide. So if you watch a dog right before it takes a nap or something, it often will do these. Now what's cool about these physiological sizes is from work in our lab and that's still ongoing, I just wanna say it's still ongoing, but work in other labs as well, double inhales followed by an extended exhale are the fastest way that I'm aware of to bring the mind and the body into a more relaxed no way. state. Really? Yeah. It, the it only, fastest way. The so fastest if I'm stressed, way. I'm overwhelmed, just do a Three or two? Two inhales through the nose, and then exhale slow through the mouth. One to three of those repeated will bring your level of autonomic arousal down basically to baseline. Rule number two, reward your effort. 
incidentally, or not so incidentally, I should say, when you look at communities of very high performers, and I'm fortunate enough to do some consulting with some people from special forces communities and so forth, they're very good, as are you, at attaching a reward to specific behaviors in subjective ways. So growth mindset and these dopamine rewards that we subjectively apply are not about saying, oh, you know, I had a terrible day, I performed poorly, but you know what, it's great, I just feel great anyway. It's not about that. It's not about attaching your sense of reward to the ultimate goal. It's about attaching your sense of reward to the fact that you're making action steps that are generally in the right direction. The more you can reward the effort process, the better off you are at building these kinds of neural circuits and these kind of tendencies to be able to lean into anything challenging over essentially any duration. Rule number three, commit. I didn't have the power of concentration. I hadn't read all the good books that done high school students read growing up. I had to learn how to speak properly. I learned how to mm. learn how to think properly and really learn how to commit to something that was very linear and at times was very painful. And, and I went to some pretty extreme things. I, um, you know, I actually used to set a timer, uh, and I wouldn't allow myself to get out of the chair until I was, the timer went off. Right. So, and I would ex experience extreme agitation, but over time I got pretty good. And now I can do long stints of work without any breaks. Rule number four, enjoy the pursuit of the goal. What's interesting about growth mindset is that it seems like there's some attachment of the reward systems of the brain to the action or the pursuit of a goal, not just achieving a goal. And when we step back and we look at what that really entails at a neurochemical level, we have reward systems in the brain. They generally fall into two categories. They're the reward systems that make you feel really good with kind of the here and now and everything that's within the confines of your skin and the things you already have, you know, love of your dog, love of your spouse, um, gratitude for all the things you happen to have. And, th and those are generally governed by the release of molecules like serotonin and oxytocin, okay? But then there's another reward system, which is the one that drove a lot of human evolution, which is the dopamine reward system. Now, dopamine is a very misunderstood molecule. It's often talked about only in the context of reward. Like I'm going to work to this goal. I'm going to build my company. I'm going to, you know, get tenure as a professor, whatever it is. And you reach it and you get this dopamine reward. And indeed that's true. But what's often not discussed is that dopamine is secreted en route to rewards while you pursue rewards. Now, the ability to tap into that system, to subjectively amplify that pathway of reward in pursuit of goals is an absolute game changer when it comes to things like anything challenging that of long duration or uncertainty or getting through this COVID you know, pandemic situation. The, but the amazing thing is, remember, the brain only does five things and we get to decide which of those sensations and perceptions have relevance and which ones don't or which ones are attached to a goal and which ones aren't. So growth mindset in its purest form is the attachment of these reward systems to the effort process, to the friction process, mm -hmm. and not just to obtaining a reward. And just as a kind of final point to that, there's a very um, well-known body of literature in neuroscience, at least among neuroscientists, that talks about something called reward prediction error. And it says, if you can dose the dopamine subjectively as you go through the pursuit of something and then have a lot of dopamine when you reach that thing, it's very likely that you're going to reinforce that circuit. There will be neural plasticity and that circuit will become stronger. So the next time you will revisit those sets of behaviors. The opposite can happen too, where you're in real anticipation of something. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. And then you reach that goal and it's kind of underwhelming. And that generally triggers this the circuit that I referred to earlier, this kind of disappointment or dep pro-depressive circuit. So dopamine is involved in reward, but it's also involved in the pursuit of rewards. And so as you reach a milestone or as you tell yourself, I'm on the right track, this friction I'm feeling, this late night, this early morning, this hard conversation with somebody that doesn't feel good, I'm going to tell myself this is for a larger purpose. That's that subjective insertion, that abstraction that we were talking about earlier. And when you start releasing dopamine to those kinds of things, there's essentially no limit on the number of things you can do or the energy to do them. So just as a last, last point about dopamine, when we're in effort, we're always secreting adrenaline. We're always in pursuit and it's draining, it's tiring. Dopamine has this beautiful capacity to buffer adrenaline. 
And you know this, you've experienced this before because if you've ever been working really, really hard, maybe your team is depleted, everything's just a mess and somebody cracks a joke and all of a sudden in an instant, it's like everything's reframed. That couldn't have been hormonal. Hormones work on that on the schedule of like hours to days to weeks. It had to be neurochemical. It absolutely had to be neurochemical and that neurochemical is dopamine. Also, if you wanna have more self-belief and more self-confidence, I've created a special free program where every day for the next 254 days, I will send you an unlisted video to help you boost your self-belief and self-confidence. The link to join for free is in the description below. You were up and dressed and ready to go before your parents were up. You know why? Because you knew something unexpected was going to happen. That's how we should live our lives. Waking up with the understanding to expect the unexpected. Stop resisting. I encourage you. Stop resisting the natural flow of epic performance. Stop resisting the natural seasons of life. Rule number five, read. I would hide in the tower books section. Uh, in the evenings, uh -huh. and I would read everything about fitness, psychology, anything I could. I've, I've always devoured information. My favorite book when I was a kid was the Encyclopedia or the Guinness Book of <laughs> World's right. Records. So I would like when uh -huh. I was a little kid, I'd walk around the Aspen Center for Physics, and I would tell anyone. I didn't even ask them if they wanted to hear about like the what's the world's smallest eutherian mammal. You know, I would mm -hmm. like it could tell you all these facts that were kind of meaningless at the time. But um, I've always been fascinated by the inventory of different animals on the planet and their different behaviors. And so, yeah, voracious reader, and still now. Yeah, I love I love information. Rule number six, embrace stress. There is something called adrenal insufficiency syndrome, which is a real medical phenomenon where the adrenals are incapable of making these cortisol and adrenal hormones. But the, the truth is that you have enough adrenaline and cortisol in your body to last two lifetimes and 25 famines. I mean, we were built with a lot of robustness, right? <laughs> right. This explains, you know, the you know the David Goggins of the world. They yeah. they they you know, we we all do have that greater capacity that people talk about. The stress is very misunderstood because people think of stress as this ancient carryover that's very unfortunate. It kind of gets lumped with depression, like, oh, this is just a, a a flaw in our design or something. But actually, stress is wonderful. It actually activates our immune system. So. Hmm. Anytime you liberate adrenaline into your bloodstream, you also protect yourself against infection of bacteria and viruses. Because if you think about it, if we had to gather food and we didn't have it, and we had to then pack up and you know migrate long distances, you can't afford to get sick. And this is why people who work, 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 and then rest, they usually get sick when they finally stop and rest. Really? Yeah, it's like the post-finals phenomenon in university or after the season for a game or the caretaker thing where you're taking care of somebody who's ill and you're just, work, 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 or taking care of young children, and then you finally stop to rest, you go on vacation, and you get slammed with, with an Why illness. Why is that? Because you're being in your comfort zone now? or you're it's because so stress turned off. And adrenaline, uh -huh. and so that these the stress response recruits the immune organs of the body to release killer T cells. In fact, Wim Hof breathing, I know you're familiar mm -hmm. with Wim, the, of doing 20 or 30 deep inhales and exhales, and also combined with some breath hold type work, exhale mm -hmm. hold, inhale hold, is known to stimulate adrenaline release. And the one of the better papers that's out there, scientific peer-reviewed papers, is a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they brought in two groups. Um, one group um, did Wim Hof breathing. The other group did just uh, mindful meditation. Both groups were injected with E. coli. <laughs> right? crazy. Right? It's uh, crazy. Right? It's crazy. It's crazy. The meditators got fever, diarrhea, and, and, um, and vomiting. And the people who did Wim Hof they either didn't get it or got it to a much lesser it felt extent. Sluggish, but That's not. Right. They didn't. Right. Isn't that this crazy? is not an experiment to do at home. Isn't this but, crazy? But it makes perfect sense because it that breathing simulates a stress response. It stimulates cortisol and adrenaline, which signals which to the, protects the body. Right. Which signals to the thymus, the spleen, and the other you know the 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 nodes of the immune system to liberate killer cells. And so when that bacteria comes in, the system is ready for it. Yeah. Your body is defending against viruses that's and right. disease, that's essentially. Right. When, you, to, when you create a routine of healthy stress. That's right. And, and we could talk about, we definitely want to, you don't want stress on all the time. Sleep is really important, et cetera. But that stress response combats infection because it recruits immune cells. Rule number seven, keep things in perspective.
Why, why fear? Why do we have fears? Why do we have trauma? Why do we have shame? And here's the stinger. It was all set up for you in your youth. I don't want to focus on the bad, but most of this stuff, when you're young, you're just a passive learning machine. It's all coming in. Little kids are learning three languages with no accents, flexibly. They're not even thinking about it. They're learning instruments. You know, someone asked a great question the other day at the workshop. Wait, now I know I want all that stuff. How come it's so much tougher? And there's a lot of biology that I'd be happy to tell you about that explains why that all shuts down after these so-called critical periods during development. So what happens when you're an adult and you want to change your brain? So now I'm going to get into the stuff that's, that hopefully is useful to you. Okay, so these basic facts, that changing your brain in a real way as an adult requires that you do particular things that activate particular chemical systems in your brain. So how do you do that, right? I could tell you all about the chemicals and I'll tell you a little bit about them, but how do you do it? Okay, so this is a right here, right now, urgent situation, car wreck. It's terrible. You could imagine any other trauma in its place. When that happens, a little area in the base of the brain, the name isn't important, but if you care, it's called nucleus basalis, does its job, which is just, a, it's an alert system. It puts all its attention on right here, right now, get everybody safe, it's your alert system. And it has this effect of dumping out a certain chemical called acetylcholine at specific locations in the brain that are paired with that experience. And forever, that experience will be traumatic unless something else is done, okay? So there's some nuance and some details to this, but that pretty much summarizes it. It's been replicated many, many times in dozens of studies. You can pair pretty much any experience with stimulation of nucleus basalis, this thing in the, in the base of the brain, and that experience will be mapped or remapped in your brain as an adult. And that's remarkable. It's also exciting because then I, someone like me says, well, then how do I change my experience? How do I change the meaning of what happens? How do I change something from traumatic to positive? The good news is nucleus basalis is just a slave to whatever is exciting, traumatic, it likes emotion, it, like, it likes peaks and lows. And so if acetylcholine is released, that means you can massively change your brain at that moment with whatever's paired with it. And so when you get into a peak state here and you're jumping up and down, or you're in a really low state and you're thinking how miserable something is, you have to be really careful because those are the things that you're wiring in, all right? So you can move to a state like this about driving later, if you form enough associations with driving to really eliminate, to override the fear, you need to create a positive experience in its place. So how do you do that? So I'm gonna tell you that the way to do that is not to think too hard and to not verbalize things too much. And this is coming from someone who spent 25 years, three times a week on a couch, letting subconscious things geyser up. And that's where I really learned that it was really the things that you don't realize that have the potential to have the most impact. But this power of emotion, the ability to couple really strong emotions with things is so useful if you want to change your brain for the better. And the way you do that is clear in the physical space. We all know this story. There are many news cases like this. Woman's child stuck under car, superhuman strength. We heard a lot of amazing stories about desperation. JJ's story was one of desperation. She's like, no, I'm not going to accept failure because failure in the case, in the case she was describing was potentially the death of her child. So desperation is a strong one and it's motiva motivated by fear. But what if you're not in a desperate state and you really want to do something? In that case, there's something remarkable. And then we should, and we should ask ourselves, why are children such great passive learners? They're not trying, they're just learning. They're coming home with all sorts of things, sometimes things you don't want them to come home with, right? It's because they have this element of play. And what is play? Play isn't just movement, although it includes movement. It's giving things everything you've got but keeping it in perspective. It's that sweet spot of enjoying life and trying really, really hard at it at the same time. It's essentially what we all strive for. And there are these incredible cases throughout history. Famous scientists, because I grew up in a house where people you know, revered scientists like, like Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner. He's most famous for bongo drumming naked on the roof of Caltech. And he became an amazing artist in his 60s. And he developed all sorts of other skills. And he always had this childlike way of looking at the world. He never let himself get stuck in his ways never became a curmudgeon and a remarkable man. And that's something that I, if you come away with nothing else, I encourage you to do that. You want your brain to change, stay light, stay loose, but give it everything you've got. Rule number eight, direct your brain changes. Can a person make it so they never get depressed? They never react to um, their perception, their people's actions towards them where they never get to a state of, ah, uh, I don't feel good, I'm feeling more depressed, I'm in a, a dark place now, I'm stuck in this place. Is there a way that we could ever defend ourselves against negative stressors, negative emotions? Or are we just, are they, do we need them as well to have contrast yeah. in life? 
Well, there's sort of two views on this. Um, I'll reveal mine after I um, sort of uh, explain the two views. One is that these states, uh, I guess I'm, I'm automatically calling things like depression a state of mind. A state and of body. mind. Is it, so when I say state of mind, I mean brain and body. Because your body is really feeling, it's like the brain is connected to the body. Right. And so if you're saying internally the thought of like, I'm depressed, or I don't feel good, or I'm sad, or I'm lonely, or I'm not good enough, the body's gonna react. Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. Like the body's going to manifest what the mind is telling you. Absolutely. The thought, the idea, you're gonna be like, I'm sad, I'm not good enough, you're gonna shrink. Right. Is that right? That's right. I mean, there are really two forms of depression. Um, sometimes they're intermixed, but one is anxiety-associated depression, and you, you, if you've ever experienced it, or for anyone that's experienced it, they feel agitation in their body and their mind races, but in their body. So the body is recruited. There are also depressive states that people feel very fatigued and exhausted It's an overwhelm. And they also experience that in their body. The, the idea of getting out of bed in the morning is hard, um, motivating to exercise, doing the sorts of things that we know are powerful for pushing back on depression. Mm -hmm. So the body is recruited. I think most people would say that Depressive states are bad when they bring down the baseline on life. I, just to, as a brief aside, anytime there's a question about mental health or addiction or trauma or anything, one could look at it and make up some argument of, well, evolutionarily, this makes sense. We all get depressed. Or, but we have to be fair to the person experiencing it, of course, and have sensitivity that some behaviors will keep the baseline of our life steady, meaning job, relationships, et cetera, will continue as they are. Other activities will tend to improve the baseline on our life. Job, activities, relationship, et cetera, will, will improve. And then there's some things like heroin, which does very quickly, we can predict that very quickly the baseline on life is going to creep down regardless of who that person is, mm -hmm. right? So people say, can you get addicted to water? Well, maybe, but I have to drink a lot of water before the baseline of my life starts to go down. So it sure. just feels uncomfortable. That's just right. It's like, man, I'm so bloated. Exactly. All <laughs> right. So we tend to throw around things like addiction and depression a little loosely. So yeah. I, I think that it's fair to say that depression is wired into us as a possible state that we could all fall into, but that it's very important, in my opinion, that humans have tools to remove themselves from that state. Mm -hmm. Of course, to avoid you know, tragedies like suicide, but also because when the baseline on someone's life goes down far enough, they find it increasingly hard to do the sorts of things that are going to get them out of depression. So you or I could say... So they stay in that state of depression because right. oh, it's too hard to go work out. It's too hard to change my habit right. of eating healthier, so I'm going to stay... Uh, I'm going to keep eating ice cream, which is going to make my body, you know, depressed. That's right. Right? If I That's keep right. eating bad foods, if I keep staying up till 4 a.m., if I keep staying in a toxic relationship, I'm going to feel depressed. That's right. And eventually, because of this very um, inseparable relationship between the brain and body, eventually what happens is that because the brain controls the body, but also the body can control the brain, mm. people lose the ability to intervene in this depressive process. So you or I could say, look, if someone who's depressed, they what they need to do is get up early, get some light in their eyes, yes. um, get some movement. I know you put this information out there, which I love because these the, those tips are grounded in, I, I'll, they're not even tips, they're really tools. Yes. And they're very powerful because they're grounded in excellent science. You get that dopamine release early in the day that's antidepressive. You time your sleep better when you get sun in your eyes and you get movement early in the day. For most people, that's accessible and they should be, they absolutely should be doing it. Everyone should be doing that. But for people who are far enough down that path of depression, because the body and the mind have this relationship that's so close, it be, there is a crossover point where they really can't do those activities. Because and they're so far deep in the depression. The body won't do what they decide to do. And so, now I'm not trying to give anyone a pass because ultimately we are all responsible for our own mental health. Certainly adults more mm -hmm. than kids, but you know, we're all responsible for our own mental health and only we can direct our own brain changes. That's, yes. the, that's the stinger. Mm. Once we're you know, 25 years and older, we are the only ones that can change our brain. And we can talk about neuroplasticity if you like, but the depressed person has to take responsibility for their behavior, but this is why it's so important to catch this brain-body relationship early and build 
routines that keep one out of depression. So that was a long path back mm-hmm. to answer your question succinctly, I hope, which is we can stay out of depression, but we have to keep depression at bay by doing things regularly. Rule number nine, understand your nervous system. The study of neuroscience is really about what the nervous system does. And amazingly enough, the nervous system is responsible for everything that happens to us from the time that we're born until the time we die. But that really boils down to only five things. The nervous system has the responsibility of sensation. So sensing the physical events in the environment. We have these so-called receptors in the eyes, in the ears, in the nose, in the mouth, on the skin that take physical entities in the, in the universe that are real fixed non-negotiable things like sound waves and photons of light and chemicals in the environment traveling that make it into our nose and things like that and convert those into the second thing, which is perceptions. So the nervous system's responsibility is to take those sensations, which are non-negotiable and perceive certain ones and not others. So for instance, right now, until I say, you know, what's the sensation of your feet contacting the floor or the bottoms of your shoes? You weren't thinking about it, but those pressure receptors were being engaged the entire time. So your perception is like a window or a spotlight that's very much linked to attention. Then there are emotions, often called feelings. And those are really designed to push us down particular avenues of perception and the next thing, which are thoughts. Okay, so we've got sensation, perception, feelings, and then there are thoughts, which really have a lot to do with what we're perceiving and the way we're organizing those perceptions, what they mean. And generally that's put into the context of what we already know or memories. And then the fifth thing is behaviors or actions. And of course, neurons are responsible for generating actions. And there are really two kinds of actions. There are the actions that you generate reflexively, like your breathing and your heart rate right now are largely reflexive, or you could decide control of your respiration and be, make it voluntary, right? And not just reflexive. So those five things, sensations, perceptions, feelings, thoughts, and actions really encompass all of our life experience. And that's from the very mundane of getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth to the most awe-inspiring Uh, uh, goal-motivated, pinnacle moments of your life, the nervous system, not the immune system, not the digestive system, all of which are important, but the nervous system, meaning the brain, spinal cord, and the connections with the body and the connections from the body back to the brain and spinal cord are responsible for all of that. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is alter your view of the world. Everything that happens to you, your entire experience, I don't care what anyone says, I don't care what alignment the earth is in, everything is happening because your brain has these three jobs. And all of your experience is filtered through that thing in your head, that pile of cells that's arranged in a very specific way that we're still trying to understand called your brain. Just like we could be talking about the heart whose job is to pump blood. So I wanna describe just how the brain works in three basic ways, two of which you've heard about before. We all have heard the lizard brain, the thing that freaks you out when you think there's someone standing in the corner and they turn on the light and there's nobody or if you were to come up on a car wreck and all of a sudden your heart's pumping, your brain is very good at that stuff and that's great, that's why you're alive at this moment. It is an unerring, unfailing system keeping you alive, your lizard brain. And it's generally designed to keep you alive and to scare you from doing things that would hurt you. And it's a shame because I would have liked it to be generally good at making me feel good all the time. But that's generally not what it's good at. And I'm stealing from the great Tony Robbins who says, you know, there's paved roads to fear and misery and cobblestone or dirt roads to happiness. And that's true at the level of neuroanatomy. You don't have a whole lot of your brain devoted to happiness. You got a lot of your brain designed to keep you safe. So anxieties and fears come about a lot easier and you need to combat those. We're all getting better at that. Thinking, planning, imagining, and doing is the other kind of end of the spectrum. I talked about that. And then there's the one that really counts, right? Which is this thing in the middle, which is the way that those things are connected. What do you think depends on how you feel? What you feel depends on how you think. We know this now, this kind of common knowledge, and it's these maps of your experience. It depends on what happened to you and how you view the world. And we know this at a psychological level. Neuroscientists sometimes talk like this. They often don't. I'm um, in the minority. But there's a lot of neuroanatomy. There's a lot of powerful neuroscience to support this. What do I mean by your maps of experience? I mean what happened to you shapes how you view the world. And so what's important is how you change how you view the world if you want to go forward beyond what would just how you were programmed, let's say. 
Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your specific plan of action for the next week? When you just watch a video and get motivated by it, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated and then create a specific plan of action, you have a 91% chance of following through. That's what we do here at Believe Nation. We get motivated, but then we do something about it. And when you commit to other people, you increase your chances even further of following through. So what was your biggest takeaway from this video? And then what is your plan of action around for this week? Put it down in the comments below because I want to celebrate you. It was me realizing I'm, you know, I'm living in this squat where I've got a pet ferret. My girlfriend's gone. She broke up with me. She was smart enough to break up with me. You know, um, I'm getting in fights. I'm working at a bagel shop. I'm barely making ends meet. And at that point I just made the decision. I just said, okay, look, I'm, I'm not going to be a professional athlete. I think I'm pretty good at memorizing things. I think I have an interest in people. I'm going to just decide. I just decided to do school. I decided that was the, that was the track. So like some people pick the military because it's a, like if you you know what to expect at least in terms of the, the you know the passages that you're going to go through. And for me that was school. And so I had decided to get back in school. I moved into a studio apartment by myself. I quit partying completely. I didn't go to parties. I got really serious about fitness. So I just started running and lifting mm -hmm. weights. And I studied. You went like Henry Rollins style. I did. Yeah, I did. That's I did a not, lot of self awareness. Yeah, you know, I mean, people go into the military because, on some level, I mean, some people do because there there's some yearning for for having that structure imposed upon their lives. But you you constructed that that kind of um, structure for yourself. Yeah, I think I was really afraid. I think I was like, you know, and I, and these days, you know, cause my lab studies fear and I get into this whole thing around mindsets. People always ask me like, is it better to do something from a place of love or fear? Like it depends. And yeah. at that point, fear was the best motivator for me. And I just basically worked like crazy. If you want 10 more awesome rules from John Asaraf, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Building a business is all about recognizing patterns and knowing which move to make at the right time.